So there's been a fair share of poor footballing owners down the years. Mike Ashley of Newcastle United, Steve Dale of Bury FC, who didn't even know who Bury were when he bought them. I didn't even know there was a football team called Bury, to be honest with you. I'm not a football fan. Mel Morris of Derby County. Actually, no, I take that back. He was a really good owner, he was. Did a really good job at Derby County. Every club at some point has probably had an owner that you look at and think they don't know what they're doing, they're not actually invested. Between 2012 and 2017, we had a curated business group, Onus, promising big things as ever, huge ambitions, but they very, very much failed to deliver. And in this video, I'm going to be going over it all. This is the story of the Al Hasawi years at Nottingham Forest. So a bit of background information first, the Al Hasawis were an incredibly rich family from Kuwait. Worth up to £1.4 billion, they specialised in many businesses, in hotels, property, refrigeration, air conditioning. But they did have some experience of owning a football club in one of the most prolific football clubs in Kuwait, in Katsia SC. They'd won pretty much every title available in their two years of ownership. So... They had some experience, but curated football is totally different to English football. So would they be able to adapt? Forest had just survived relegation the year before to League One under the management of Steve Cottrell, surviving by 10 points. And you'd think, you know, you'd give him a chance at least to keep going. But no, the Al Hasaris would fire him. And despite firing him, they would still apparently, according to The Athletic, keep in contact with him to get advice, to ask him about the players, what kind of squad they had, you know, where they could improve it. You've just sacked him. Alarm bells are happening already, and I'm thinking, what's going on here? Kotcher would be replaced by former Bournemouth and Doncaster manager and his former number two, Sean O'Driscoll. Forrest would sign 12 players in this first transfer window, spending £6 million on players. The likes of Adlen Guediura, Simon Cox, Henry Lansbury, Danny Collins, Greg Halford, Billy Sharp would all come into the club to name but a few. Forrest would have a pretty good start to the season, of course having come 19th the year before. To be in the top 10 most in the first half of the year is a very good start. But around November time of this season, and there's no official dates or understanding as to why this even happened, Omar Al Hasari would no longer be involved in the club. He would leave. He is not part of this club anymore. And it was just Faraz and Adel Azidis. But I say Adel Azidis, it's just Faraz basically. Fast forward to Boxing Day 2012. Forest had Leeds United at home. Leeds had won five of their last six matches and were in a very good spell of form. So were Forest, or at least in a good position in the league. Until we beat them 4 2 and went one point off the playoffs. This is brilliant. We were 19th last year. We're now on the brink of the playoffs. What a job Sean O'Driscoll's doing. We could be in for a very good year here until they sack him a few hours later. But their reason was they wanted a Premier League experienced manager. Weird time to appoint one when you've got one that's already doing a good job. So they turned to former Birmingham and Aston Villa manager Alex McLeish, who did indeed have Premier League experience. But immediately, it didn't feel right. It felt like there was definitely a disagreement between him and Faraz about a lack of backing and just not giving him the funds that Faraz would have promised him that he would have had to sign players. The classic example is on deadline day when Forrest tried to sign George Boyd from Peterborough, who had had a good season at the time for Peterborough, but apparently he failed an eye test which meant that he couldn't join before the deadline closed and that that doesn't sound like a likely story really and Peter Boo United were really quite angry at Forrest about that. Forrest would still sign five players in this January window though, Stephen McLaughlin, Darius Henderson, Khalid Al Rashidi, Elliot Ward and Gonzalo Yara. It's worth putting out Rashidi is a Q80 goalkeeper and we've got Q80 owners so yeah it was only a matter of time and it made no sense whatsoever because we already had three goalkeepers at the club and he was no better than any of them. And fast forward 40 days, Alex McLeish would already be gone from Forest, having won just one in seven games, that being against Peterborough. He drew against Derby in that time as well. And quite clearly a big disagreement and it just weren't on the same wavelength at all as far as only who would be. So in five weeks, Forest had gone from one place off the playoffs and one point off the playoffs to 11th. 
But of course, we now have to go and we get another manager, a fourth manager in the same season. That's counting Steve Cottrell that didn't even get a game under the Al Hasawis. And we turn to former Forest manager Billy Davis to come back for a second stint, signing a two and a half year deal. Davis had previously got Forest into the playoffs two seasons in a row, but ultimately failing against Blackpool and Swansea. There was huge delight about this appointment, and as Billy himself called it, there was unfinished business to attend to. Billy will be with us like Ferguson with Manchester United. You mean that? Of course, I mean that. This is football heritage. It's also worth pointing out that as soon as Davis took over, there were several key members of the backroom staff that would leave the club, the likes of Frank Clark, who was club ambassador at the time, Mark Arthur, chief executive and head of recruitment, Keith Burt, would also leave the club. That's quite a massive void to fill. But on the pitch, Davis would not lose his first 10 games, winning six of them in a row. However, four of them were draws, which meant that Forrest still could have moved at the league more despite not losing for 10 games. And ultimately this would cost Forrest significantly. It would mean that on the last day of the year against Leicester City, Forrest were outside the playoffs and had to win to stand a chance of getting in it. And of course if Leicester won, then they would go in the playoffs instead. Simon Cox would give Forrest the lead early on, scrambling a ball over the line until Matty James and Andy King gave Leicester the lead before half time. Going into the second half, Elliot Ward headed one in for Forrest to level things up and it was all level pegging until the end of the game until Leicester had a breakaway goal from Anthony Knockhart and that was it. Forrest finished 8th in the championship, still a very respectful finish and an encouraging finish saying that we came 19th the year before but it was still disappointing to miss out on the top 6 by just one point. <laughs> Again, the club had signed 12 players in this season, the likes of Jamie Mackey, Jamie Patterson, Eric Lehigh, Darius De Vries, and Gonzalo Yara, to name but a few, would come into the club. Now, some of these players coming in were coming in on much higher wages than some of the existing players, and according to The Athletic, this did cause a bit of a stir in the dressing room. It caused a divide. Only, regardless of that, Forest still had a very good start to the season. Only losing once in the first 12 matches, including a 1-0 win against Derby County, in which new signing Jack Hobbs headed the goal in to get Forest the win. This form would give Billy Davis a brand new four-year deal and fast forward to January, and Forest would be beating Premier League teams 5-0 in West Ham. And you would have thought that in the January window, we would have pushed hard to really sign some proper quality, you know, ambition. Really make sure we get over the line this time. No, that, that didn't really happen. Forrest would sign Rafiq Jabor, Danny Fox, Lee Pleitener, Kevin Gomez, and David Vaughan would come back on loan as well as Jack Cobb signing permanently from Hull. Now, there's quite a famous photo of Faraz posing with three of these new signings before a match in Jabor, Gomez, and Danny Fox. And it's pretty ironic when two of them were quite horrific failures. Jabor would only play eight games. He did get one goal, but... He didn't do anything other than that. I don't remember him that well, if I'm entirely honest, but he wasn't. He's not very well spoken about. And Gomez would only play one full 90 minutes at the club in a 1 0 defeat against Barnsley. And Danny Fox, fair play to him, he would actually outlast the entire Faraz tenure, so he did do well. But going back to when Davis had signed his new contract, besides three defeats not long after he'd done that, Forrest only continued to get stronger until game 30, when Forrest beat Huddersfield 3-0 away from home to go fifth in the championship. But this would be Billy Davis' final win as Nottingham Forest manager, because after that, Forrest would not win for 12 matches. And after the seventh game of that run, a 5-0 defeat away at Derby County, that would be it for Billy Davis, the fourth manager to be fired by the Faraz regime and it probably been coming before that would have formed because B Davis for quite some time at that stage had imposed media blackouts he wouldn't allow the press to come to the city ground unless it was for post-match reactions and in his interviews he was really quite vague and cryptic we reserve right yeah no comment to, to, to pass judgment no comment 
And I'd like to say to you, no comment. And this would mean that Gary Brazil would take over for the rest of the season, of course, the youth team manager at the time, and he still is to this day. However, we did attempt to try and appoint an actual manager for the rest of the year and beyond. We did try and sign Neil Warnock, but he didn't want to join because he feared that Faraz would interfere with team selections, which isn't the owner's job to do that. However, we contacted Stuart Pearce and he initially rejected us, but he did agree to become Forest manager at the end of the season. A club legend, over 400 appearances for the club. It was a brilliant move. However, the decline under Davis meant that Forest would come 11th place under Gary Brazil at the end of the year. So, with Stuart Pearce now in charge, there was a big ambition and buzz around the ground and the whole club. And we break our transfer record by signing Brit Asomba Longa from Peterborough in a deal nearly 7 million euros worth. It was a big move. Michel Antonio would come into the club as well, Michael Mancian, David Vaughan and Danny Fox would sign permanently as well to name but a few. However, Carl Darlow and Jamal Lascelles would agree to join Newcastle, and you're never going to guess, Faraz had passed the deal without consulting the management. Again, for the third year in a row, Faraz would have a strong start to the season, winning five of the first seven matches. A 5-3 win against Fulham would be a very noticeable game. A 4-0 win against Reading as well would be a noticeable highlight. However, in a game against Derby County, in which we drew one all. Chris Cohen and Andy Reid would suffer long-term injuries and just in general, injuries would mount up and Forrest would start to decline. However, it was around about this time that Forrest were accused of breaking FFP rules, financial fair play that is. And of course, this means that we were put under a transfer embargo for the rest of the season, meaning we could only sign players for free and on loan and they couldn't be given wages over £10,000 a week. It's also worth pointing out on the pitch at least, Forrest were top of the league at one stage at the start in that seven game start to the season that we had where we were looking brilliant. But then after that, two wins in 18 matches would follow against Norwich and Wolves and would even be embarrassed in the FA Cup against League One Rochdale. So by the time that Forrest played Derby County away from home, Stuart Pearce would be on the brink. An own goal from Henry Lansbury gave Derby the lead but of course Britta Sombolonga in the second half did convert one to level things up until youngster Ben Osborne did this. Towards the edge of the penalty area, the youngster goes on and smashes it home! What a strike from Ben Osborne! That win would give Pearce two more matches, but he'd lose both of them against Fulham and Millwall, and that would spell the end for Stuart Pearce. It's a real shame that a club legend couldn't have been more of a success, but again, it wasn't really his fault under a transfer embargo. Chief Executive Paul Faulkner would also leave the club the next day. Apparently, given the fact that Faraz had been interfering in his work and just a general lack of control at the club. Given our restrictions, Forrest would sign four players on loan in the January window, these being Gary Gardner from Villa, Todd Kane from Chelsea, Tuba Akpom from Arsenal, and Modu Barrow from Swansea. All of them, besides Gary Gardner, would fail to make any real impact as well. So yet again, signing players that didn't end up working. So who next after Stuart Pearce? Well, it would be former Forest striker Doogie Friedman, and he would win seven of his first 10 matches. He got the team scoring again. We won 3-0 against Wigan, 4-1 against Bolton, 3-0 away at Reading. However, Forest could not reach any higher than ninth, but Friedman would still be given a new two-year contract after his impressive start at the club. But again, what seemed now like an annual dreadful end to the season happened again. Six defeats in the final eight matches saw Forest drop off to 14th place, only managing two draws in that period against Brentford and Blackburn, both away from home. Forest would again be put under a transfer embargo this season, again failing to reach FFP rules of having 21.5 million in losses 
the year that we were under a transfer embargo the first time. We did not learn our lesson, seemingly. We signed three players on freeze. Jemmy Ward from Derby, Matt Mills would come in as well, and Danny Peneos, plus six players on loan. The likes of Nelson Oliveira being the main one on loan from Benfica. It was obviously clear at this stage that the finances of the club were a mess. But it was also quite obvious as well that players and staff were failing to be paid on time as well. So as well as breaking FFP rules, we weren't paying the players and staff on time. It's also worth pointing out that one of the signings that we made in this window was Ben Hamer, a goalkeeper from Leicester. But he would also end up going back to Leicester in the same window and not coming back. We obviously signed him and realised, oh we can't afford to pay his wages, or there was some disagreement. Yet again, just a general lack of control or direction or plan. Three wins in the first seven would put Forrest no higher than eighth place, and that would be the highest we would get that season. And after this run, eight games without a win would result in Forrest, yet again, putting pressure on the manager. But thankfully for Friedman, he did manage to turn it around temporarily, not losing for the next 14 matches. This one was even more impressive given the fact that obviously we've been restricted to signing players and again, we were starting to pile up quite a few injuries. So Friedman deserved credit for what he managed to do under the circumstances. Similar to Billy Davis's first initial run where he drew too many games, that was the same here. So again, we weren't exactly moving up the league or doing anything too spectacular. In the January window, we would again sign players, and again, we couldn't sign them permanently. Ojan Jogic would come from Villarreal as well. And of course, it's worth pointing out, a little known name nowadays, Joe Wall, would be loaned out to Dagenham and Redbridge. A 3 0 defeat at home to Sheffield Wednesday would be the final straw for Friedman, but it still felt incredibly harsh. The fact that he even managed to get a good run of form going under those circumstances. It's worth putting out, Brett Sombolonga, our top scorer the year before, spent 90% of this season injured. In fact, Friedman told The Athletic in 2020 this, It was disappointing when he ended things because I honestly believe I was close to getting things right at Forest. One summer window without an embargo would have made a massive difference. It would be first team coach Paul Williams to take over the club for the rest of the season but he would have a very minimal impact and again, Forrest would continue to drop off and fall down the table, this time Forrest coming in 16th place. Now thankfully from this season onwards, Forrest were no longer under a transfer embargo so we could finally sign players for money. You know, we had no restrictions anymore, so that was good. But of course, we would still need to find a new manager and we turn to someone that I think very few people would have actually heard of when he was first appointed, former Real Sociedad dad and Ren manager, Felipe Montagna. And it was also rumoured in the summer of this season that potentially there may be a takeover happening at some stage. A little known man called Evangelos Maranakis was apparently interested in buying the club, but nothing would come to it. In the transfer market, Forrest again, like I say, could sign players for money, so we would sign Apostolos Velias, a striker for 1.20 million euros, Lika from Porto, Thomas Lamb would come in from the Netherlands, Adama Traore from QPR, Vladimir Stojkovic and Pajim Kasani from Olympiakos, and the man himself, Nicholas Bentner, would come in on a free transfer. Forrest opened the season in dramatic fashion by beating newly promoted Burton Albion 4-3 at the City Ground, in which Oliver Burke would score in that game a really good goal, a new, exciting young player coming through the Youth Academy, until he was sold to RB Leipzig for £13 million. It was a really significant moment in the way fans felt about the whole ownership situation. We were already growing very, very frustrated by the situation at the club, no real progression and stupid decisions being made, but selling a really exciting youth player to a random German club, because at the time Leipzig was still very much an unknown quantity. It just didn't make any sense. And I haven't even mentioned, of course, a couple of years back at this stage, we did sell Michel Antonio, who was our top scorer in that one season. In the 14-15 season, he was our top scorer. The next home game would be a 4-3 win against Wigan, another 4-3 win to Forest. Quite clearly, we're playing pretty exciting attacking football. But what we weren't doing 
is learning how to stop conceding goals. Despite that fairly encouraging start to the season, Forest would win just one game across September and October, a 3-1 win against Birmingham City. There was a brief upturn in form and Forest win three of four matches, a 5-2 win away at Barnsley, stands out Henry Lansbury getting a hat-trick in that game, a 2-0 win against Ipswich, and a brilliant 2-1 win against Newcastle United at home where we could have actually scored four, but we missed two penalties in that match. But a 3-0 defeat away at Derby would end that run and it was also roughly around about November, December time where John J. Moores, a US consortium, wants to try and buy Forest. So we're starting to see more and more takeover rumours happening here. But it never would, of course, go through. But John J. Moores, his deal was to try and buy an 80% share of the club. So Farrars would still have some control, but ultimately most of the control would be from this new potential owner. It would be on the 13th of January when this deal would officially be announced as off from Farrars himself. A goalless draw the next day would result in Montagnier being fired after just over half a season in charge of the club. But the failure to get yet another takeover over the line and just the constant merry-go-round of managers and decline meant that Forest fans were pretty damn annoyed at this stage. Attendances would continue to fall and protests would start to happen at the city ground, basically demanding that Faraz leaves the club and sells up. So yet again, Gary Brazil would become the first team manager temporarily and in the January window we would sign Zach Clough from Bolton and Ross McCormack, both of them on deadline day. However, yet again, Forrest would sell yet another key player in Henry Lansbury. He would join Aston Villa for an undisclosed fee. So Forrest would finally appoint a manager in former Brentford and Rangers boss Mark Warburton signing a two and a half year contract. He would have very little impact. However, his first game would be at East Midlands Derby against Derby in which we very nearly lost that at home as well. But of course, it would be Danny Pineos to score a very late goal to save Forrest from being humiliated against Derby at home, just to really rub in our decline even more. But thankfully, that was stopped. He would only manage three wins in the remaining nine matches, and as a result of that, Forrest would go into the final day of the season in an incredibly perilous position in which we needed to win to survive. We were in a position where us, Blackburn and Birmingham all could still go down on the last day of the season. Despite all being in a relegation battle, all three of us still managed to win. Brett Sambalonga would score a penalty, Chris Cohen would do this, what a thunderbolt. And then Britt would also score a great solo goal essentially, and it could have been four because we missed another penalty. But it's vital that we didn't just win, we win in style, because those three goals is what did it, not just a win the amount of goals, because we survived by two goals. But again, it signified that in five years, we had gone from finishing eighth to 21st in the championship, just a week after we survived relegation to League One on the last day of the season. We finally had a new man in charge. This being Olympiakos and shipping magnet, Evangelos Maranakis. I wonder what he would go on to achieve with the club, I just wonder. I really hope you've enjoyed this video. That was my video essay of Nottingham Forest's tenure of Faraz al Hasari. What an absolute joke it was. I thank God we're out of those days. I really have enjoyed it. If you have, hit the like button. Subscribe to Rads if you're new. I do want to try and do more videos like this, but it's very tough thinking of them, quite honestly. So please, any ideas for video essays, let me know in the comments below and I'll definitely think about them. Thanks for watching, everyone. I'll see you very soon.